Good evening, everybody. It's Dr. Galvin with tonight's coronavirus update. Uh, today's Saturday. Um, numbers for today, 2.9 million cases worldwide, 203,000 deaths, 830,000 recoveries here in the U.S. We're at 956,000 cases. We're almost at a million. 54,000 deaths, 116,000 recoveries. Here in my little neck of the woods in North Carolina, we're at 8,733 uh, cases with 304 deaths. Of interest locally is, and I've alluded to this nursing home outbreak that we've had here, and, and it's being repeated elsewhere. We're up to 20 deaths just from the nursing homes in Salisbury, North Carolina, based on a couple outbreaks there. And so those nursing home populations are being very hard hit, and North Carolina is not the only place that's seeing it. It's being seen elsewhere as well. Tonight we're going to talk a little bit about antibody testing and we're going to talk about strokes and blood clots in folks with COVID. I've gotten a lot of questions about both of those things and you know we all want to reopen. We want to reopen just as quickly as we can but we also want to reopen as safely as we can and I've talked about time and time again that in order to do that we need to have data to put into the models not guesses and we're putting guesses in right now. And unless we have real data, we're not gonna be able to tell. And that data is gonna come from both molecular testing where we're testing for the virus itself and people who we suspect have it, and as, as well as antibody testing, which may indicate people have been exposed and may have had it, maybe they weren't symptomatic or not. Now, what is antibody testing? What is that all about? Well, in essence, the, the, our, the B cells in our immune system, when they get exposed to a foreign invader, once it's recognized as an invader, the, the immune system is triggered. And one of the things that the immune system does is it produces these proteins called antibodies. And antibodies are basically little molecules that stick on these invading cells and, and signal that this is a bad guy. And then the other killer cells in the system come and destroy that. And so those antibodies are important and they come in two flavors. We have one that's called IgM and another one that's called IgG. Now, IgM is the first one that's made, and we see that sort of in an acute phase of an infection. It's less specific for the particular virus or, or foreign invader, but it, it can be produced quickly, and we'll see an initial IgM spike, and then we subsequently produce what's called IgG, and that's a more specific messenger, and that usually spikes at a later time. So sometimes a couple days to a couple weeks later. So antibody tests can check for both IgM or IgG or both. And so, an antibody test, if you take it and it's positive, it could mean that you've been exposed to the virus. There's some problems there, though. We've seen you know, a variety of numbers. Worldwide, we've been seeing you know, general rates of 2 to 3% with antibody testing, but New York City just reported 20% and 14% in the state. The study in California showed 4%. So what's going on? Well, the problem is, is we don't really have a great handle on these antibody tests. These at-home ones, the, the ones that do a prick in your finger, you know, they are, are suspect. And there was a, a, a preliminary study release that hasn't been peer-reviewed or anything else, but it looked at nine of these, um, these particular tests. And what they found was, I'm gonna just make sure I get my numbers right. Um, what they found was that 35 to 48% of them were inaccurate, meaning they either told people they didn't have antibodies when they actually did, or vice versa, they said that they have antibodies when they don't. So we need to have good data. And so just any data isn't gonna do us any good. We've gotta have good, accurate data. And so those antibody tests are gonna be very important. And, and all of you that have written to me asking me the same, you know, I've gotten the same question probably 100 times. I, w I was sick in, in December, I was sick in January, I was sick in February with cough, fever. Was it COVID? And I, I kept saying, you, you can't tell. But now, you know, it may be that if we do an antibody test on, on you, if you've had that, and you're positive, then you can say, you know what, maybe it really was COVID. Now, the other thing that the World Health Organization came out today or yesterday and said is that there's no proof yet that having antibodies against the virus protects you. So there's no clear proof yet that you can't get the virus a second time, or if you've developed antibodies, you can't subsequently get sick. So that's a big caveat, because if that's not the case, then it's a problem. Now, with SARS and MERS, which are both really deadly coronaviruses, it, it was shown that people had protective antibodies for I think one to two years after exposure to SARS and two to three years for MERS. So we would hope that this other coronavirus would be similar. The other problem is that some of these quick tests may be detecting 
and you know a bunch of other coronaviruses as well. Remember, there are other coronaviruses that cause very mild symptoms, and there's three or four that we commonly see. And so, it may be it, to showing positive for coronavirus, but it's the wrong one. And if you're positive for one of the other other versions of the coronavirus, it's not COVID, so it doesn't help us. So that's that. The other question I've gotten is, you know, is there an association between in being infected with COVID and strokes? And it's a really interesting question because in the emergency medicine world and critical care world, we have pretty open lines of communication and we hear about stuff and we actually sometimes change our management based on what other people are experiencing in other places. And I think we've talked a little bit about how radically we've changed when we intubate people from three weeks ago to now, it's, it's very, very different. We really do everything we can not to intubate because we know that most of those people die. So if we can avoid it, we can keep them alive without a ventilator, they're gonna do better. Well, there's also been these rumblings of these weird numbers of strokes and also these really big spikes in people dying at home. So, you know, New York City increased their number of deaths by three or 4,000 because of this huge spike sometimes four to five times higher from the fire department getting called for people who died at home. Now, those numbers are relatively predictable. They're fairly stable. They can be trended over a big period of time. And when you suddenly, within a month or two, have an increase by a factor of four, something's going on. And really the only thing that's changed is the virus. So attributing those deaths to the virus is, is not a long shot mental uh, jump by any means. And what we're seeing is through a couple of early studies, and there's actually a case report coming out in the New England Journal of Medicine, I think it's supposed to be released you know, tomorrow or the next day, of five cases of large vessel strokes in young folks, less than 50 years old with no medical problems. All of them had COVID, and we're seeing that. Also on autopsy, they're seeing all these clots in COVID patients' lungs, and so a lot of these people are having clotting complications when they're in the hospital, even after being put on anticoagulant medicines. Uh, there was also a Dutch study that, again, um, that was actually published and peer-reviewed that showed a 38% rate of uh, clotting abnormalities in their seriously ill patients with COVID. So why is this happening? I don't know. Again, as I'm often saying, preliminary information, I don't know. Does there seem to be an association between being infected with the virus and sudden death at home and strokes? Yes, and some of those sudden deaths, or maybe a large number of them, may be from these strokes. And the ones that we're seeing, these large vessel strokes, those are the catastrophic ones that kill people. Um, the concerning things we're seeing it in young people are healthy, and we don't know what those associations are, but I will be following this very closely, and we'll be watching it. Uh, I'm going to cut it off here. I hope everybody's having a good weekend. I don't want to bum everybody out with all this information. Remember, your chance of dying from COVID is exceptionally low. It seems like we're going to have a lot of people who are going to be potentially asymptomatic with it. I think the antibody news is so far intriguing and hopefully good and will help us get this country reopened in a quick, efficient, and safe way. We need that data to, to make those determinations though. As usual, you know, wash your hands, take care of yourselves, take care of your families, take care of those around you. Try to do a good deed, you know, every day for somebody else because there's a lot of people who are really struggling with isolation, both the mental and uh, aspects of it, but also the financial aspects of being out of work and everything else. And, you know, we've got it at this point, you know, we're Americans and, and Americans do well in crises and they look out for each other. And I want all of you guys and women, men and women to look out for those around you. As usual, if you like, find this helpful, please share it, like our uh, Facebook page and, and follow us. And more importantly, if you really like it, um, subscribe to our YouTube channel. A lot more content will be coming to the YouTube channel in the next you know, few days and weeks. We've got a lot of plans there. Um, again, everybody have a good night. We're going to get through this. Deep breath. Enjoy your Saturday night. Good night.